This morning, if you would, as we gather together, uh, turn with me to Exodus chapter 14. I'm going to pick up where I left off some time ago, speaking about um, this is the, the Exodus, the actual release of the Hebrew slaves from slavery. Uh, and as they are taking off and leaving Egypt, right, they come to the Red Sea and they're surrounded by mountains and um, the Red Sea is before them. And it is clear from the story that the Lord had led them in this way. So Exodus 14, 1, we'll just read, start reading there. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp from Piahiroth, between Migdal and the sea, over against Bel Zephon. You shall camp there by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land and wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he will follow, shall follow after them. And I will be honored or glorified upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord and that and they did so. Verse five. And it was told the king of Egypt and the, that the people fled and the heart of Pharaoh and all of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And he took his 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and the captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out on a high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen, his army, and they overtook them, encamping by the sea uh, beside Pi-Hiroth and bel Zephon. So we see here from the story that the Lord led them <laughs> to that place where they, there was no escape, right? As I shared before, there was no way out for uh, Israel. And the Lord led them there and hedged them in on every side, so that they would learn to cry out to the Lord, and so that the Lord would be glorified, right? The Lord ordained it, he orchestrated it, that he would bring about the victory, and he would gain the glory by basically drowning Pharaoh and his army in the sea. The last lesson we learned was that the Lord is sovereign, and he allows adversity into our lives for his glory, for his glory and for his honor. And he allows a verse into our lives that he may change us, as we heard earlier today, that he may make us, mold us, conform us to the image of his son. That's his desire for us, to conform us to the image of his son. And in order to do that, we must go through much tribulation. There's no way around it. We are going to face hardship and affliction, adversity, tribulation, trials in this life. But... When we do, we are to glorify our Heavenly Father, seek His face, and turn to Him in the time of need, right? We are to come before the throne of grace and mercy where we might find grace and mercy in the time of need. And He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He rules and reigns in the affairs of men. He is sovereign over all. And sometimes He ordains troubles for us Again, that we might be partakers of his holiness, that we might be conformed to the image of his son. The apostle Peter writes to the church, reminding us that we should expect trouble. In 1 Peter 4.12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. In 1 Peter 1.7, he says, The trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and the honor and the glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The trying of your faith to the honor and the glory of God. James says it this way, My brethren, James 1.2, Count it all joy when you fall into divers or various trials, temptations, tests, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. That means perfect, complete, mature. The trying of your faith leads to maturity, right? And so that's the way God works. He works in our lives through trials and adversity. If we allow him to, if we accept that, if we glorify him in that. So 
we must accept as true that whatever trial you're facing, whatever hardship, whatever circumstance, situation that you are facing right now has been orchestrated by God, no matter how difficult it is, he knows it and he has allowed it to change you, to mold you, to make you, and maybe even we don't even understand, and we may not, may not understand what he is doing until we get on the other side of eternity, right? We Oftentimes when we're going through something, we don't know why. And that's the most, probably one of the most frustrating things as a Christian. Why? You know, why is this happening? It's a very frustrating thing. But the thing I want us to turn to today, that we also, just like the Israelites, have an enemy. The Israelites had an enemy, Pharaoh, right? Pharaoh went after them. Pharaoh had enslaved them. And we have an enemy ourselves, Satan, right? Satan is our enemy. He is, in the Old Testament, Satan means the opponent, the adversary, the arch enemy of good. In the Greek, it means the accuser, the devil, the false accuser, right, of the brethren. And he accuses the brethren before God, before the throne of God, night and day, the book of Revelation tells us. We are first introduced to our adversary, Satan, in the Garden of Eden, when he appears as the serpent, right, and he entices Eve to eat the forbidden fruit. The first thing that we know or learn of this adversary is that now the serpent, Genesis 3.1 was more subtle, more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He is crafty. He is subtle, right? He deals in intrigue and deceit and deception. He is evil. The Apostle Paul wants us not to be ignorant of Satan's devices, okay? He does not want us to be ignorant of Satan's devices that, that he, Satan, may gain the advantage over us. That's 2 Corinthians 2.11. Paul encourages in Ephesians 6 that we put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. See, this war is continuing on, right? Jesus Christ has won the victory, but it's up to us to live it out. And this, this victory that we are to live out, we have an opponent, we have an enemy who tries to trip us up, who tries to um, tempt us, Lord, right, and lead us into temptation. And, and we need the Lord to deliver us from evil. Charles Spurgeon has said it this way, the, the great tyrant has not forgotten you, and he designs your capture and re-enslavement. That's why Peter tells us to be vigilant, to be on guard, because our enemy is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Even when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness by Satan, it says in, after Jesus um, won the victory there in the wilderness by defeating Satan, it says that the devil departed him for a time. In, in, some, ver in some translations, it says that the devil departed him for a more opportune time. Another opportunity to attack the Lord. And we even see that happening in Matthew 16, when Jesus is talking to his disciples about going to the cross, Peter turns to him and says, and says to Jesus, far be it from you to go to the cross. And Jesus' response in Matthew 16, 23 is, he turned to him and said unto Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. Whenever Satan attacks, whether it's covertly or overtly, he is closer and more cruel than we can ever imagine. He is truly like the Pharaoh of Exodus, or Pharaoh, we could say, is a type of Satan. And as the dictator Pharaoh, he gazed over his wasted domain. I mean, he, they had just faced 10 plagues that basically decimated Egypt. And it says the Lord was making a mockery of the gods of Egypt. All the idols of Egypt were in those uh, 10, uh, um, 10 judgments of God that were brought upon the Egyptians. And Pharaoh, he gazed down to this wasted domain, right? The slave ghettos are deserted. They've turned into ghost, in a ghost town overnight. His building projects were suspended. The sounds of the construction crews had ceased. The pounding of the hammer had stopped. There weren't any sounds of the chisel against the stone. There weren't any shouts from the foreman. There was no snap of the whip. 
There weren't any slaves to draw a bath, to cook a meal, or to bow at his feet. And Egypt was plundered. When the uh, uh, Israel left Egypt, they left with a high hand. They had plundered Egypt on the way out. People were saying, get out, take whatever you want. You know, we cannot stand up under these judgments anymore, these plagues anymore. Please leave. Egypt was plundered. Pharaoh was humiliated before his countrymen. And then Pharaoh's anger begins to rise. It's kindled. He summons the generals. He wakes the troops. He harnesses the horses. And he pursues after the Hebrews. The Egyptians, Egyptians with all the king's horses, chariots, and army, chased after Israel. And they caught up with them at the Red Sea. This morning, do you feel maybe that you're being pursued by a constant enemy? 24-7, he never stops, he never takes a holiday. I mean, some of you are probably tired uh, from this weekend's festivities, you know, uh, Thanksgiving Day, where we, our country has set aside time to honor God. Um, that's the, the meaning of Thanksgiving Day, giving thanks unto the Lord for preserving their lives. Well, maybe you're tired and worn out, but our enemy doesn't take a break. He may take a break for a time, but then he looks for a more opportune time to attack again. Maybe you felt like you were being pursued by the enemy. Maybe you've even felt at times oppressed and afflicted by an unseen foe. I mean, have you ever sensed Satan nipping at your heels, so to speak? And have you ever wondered why maybe trial after trial, simultaneous troubles, might be sent by a messenger of Satan unto you. More maybe, the depression and anger, resentment, bitterness that you're feeling might be from Satan himself. What we are to do in these times is we are to acknowledge that we do have an enemy, right? We do have an enemy, an enemy of our souls who seeks our ruin and destruction. So many times I think we... In many cases, I, I don't want to make light of anyone's trouble, but sometimes I think here in the United States, um, we have it so easy compared to the rest of the world. And, and maybe we don't realize it as much as we should that we are in a battle, a battle for the, the souls of men, and that we do have an enemy that is attacking us. We are to acknowledge that we have an enemy, but we are to give glory to God. We are to concentrate on the Lord. We are to lift up our eyes unto the Lord, who is our help, who is our victory, our Savior, right? He is the one that is going to deliver us. Pharaoh and Satan are, are both unyielding enemies, you know, the co coveting the power of God for themselves. They both have been plundered by the Almighty. Just think about it. Both Pharaoh was plundered at the time, and even Satan has been plundered by the Almighty. He is enraged at God's intervention in the history of human events. He is enraged that God would send his only begotten son to save you and to save me. He knows that his time is but short, right, to do his evil works in this earth. <clears throat> Both have armies, uh, armies of destruction and, and that are um, for the destruction and enslavement of God's people. Pharaoh realizes, and Satan, they don't realize that they are already defeated. They are defeated foes. And just like Pharaoh and the Hebrews, the Lord Jesus Christ has delivered us from the power, the dominion, the authority of Satan by the blood of Jesus Christ. His kingdom has been plundered in a, a real sense. Colossians 1.13 puts it this way, that God has delivered us from the power of darkness, and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. In Christ we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Ephesians 2, 12 and 13, the Apostle Paul says, Prior to salvation, we were without Christ. We were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. We were strangers from the covenants of promise. We had no hope and without God in the world. But now, but now, God interceded, God intervened, God interjected himself into human history. But now, Christ Jesus 
by Christ Jesus, we who sometimes were far off have been made nigh by the blood of Christ. Paul says it in Romans 6, 17 and 18. Praise the Lord. At one time you were slaves of sin, but you have obeyed basically the gospel message from the heart which was delivered unto you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. We are called the servants of righteousness. Jesus said, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. But Satan does not surrender his slaves easily, or does he surrender his prey without a fight? He comes racing uh, after the converted soul, chariot wheels churning in the dust, seeking to discourage, seeking to defeat, seeking to destroy, seeking to devour the people of God. He is a thief, right, that comes except to steal, to kill, and to destroy the people of God. But our Lord Jesus Christ came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Satan pursues with the intensity of Pharaoh. He may use old ungodly friends, old ungodly desires. He may use persecution, trials, affliction. He may even use the cares and the riches of this world to get us to turn. He tries and he tempts, he trips, up, trips us up and enslaves us in different vices. He may la launch a missile of temptation right at your heart or fire a volley of trials and troubles into your life. He tries to trap us in difficulty and entangle us in trouble, corner us in the impossible situations or lure us into temptation. And it can become quite hardening or quite difficult Right? Book of Daniel speaks about the wearing out of the saints, Daniel chapter 7. That is a tactic of the enemy to wear us out and to become weary and right and well doing. We need to acknowledge Satan's activity, but we need to keep our eyes on the author and the finisher of our faith, the Lord Jesus Christ, who allowed this chapter into our lives for his reasons, for his purposes, for his glory. He allows trials into our lives for his glory. We can resist the devil, but first, everyone knows that verse in James 4, right? Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Does anyone know what comes before that? It's actually the beginning of the verse, James 4, chapter 7. And it's the most important part of the verse, but yet we quote the second part, the least important part. James 4, 7, underline it, highlight it. I don't know, write it on your forehead. We got a, it's, this is really kind of a wonderful sandwich here, uh, really. James 4, 7, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. You want the victory in your life? You want your trials and tragedy to turn into triumph? Submit yourselves therefore to God resist the devil and he'll flee from you second part of the sandwich draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you the first and most important part if we're going to gain the victory is to keep ourselves under the authority of the Almighty under the covering of the Almighty to be submitting ourselves to Jesus Christ when we say he's our Lord and Savior, that we really mean it. And we stay the course. Our commander-in-chief has given us everything that we need to be more than conquerors, to be more than victors in Christ Jesus our Lord. 1 Peter 5, 6 through 9 says it this way, that we are to humble ourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. That's submitting to the Lordship of Jesus Christ that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. I know of, you know, I've shared this uh, with the youth group, try to share with them their acceptance in Christ, that they are beloved in Christ. Their identity is in Christ. You know, and to me, that is the greatest power there is in all of humanity, knowing that I am accepted in the beloved, that you are accepted in the beloved, that God loves you and that he cares for you. 
With that in mind, we are unstoppable. Right? With that in mind, we are unstoppable, regardless of what comes our way, whether sword or sea, knowing deep down in your heart of hearts, if you have more than one heart, knowing that Christ loves you. And it's not an issue of, well, I'm not really sure that you know that you know beyond knowing. You're confident that he loves you and he has what's best for you. What an outstanding power that we have. Rest assured on the rock of our salvation. Amen. Amen. Peter goes on to say, then, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion who walks about seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions were accomplished in your brethren that are in the world today. Paul encourages, encourages us in Ephesians 6, 13, that we are to put on every piece of the armor of God, that we are able to resist the enemy in the time of evil, standing firm in the faith. There is, should be, a resistance movement in the church. Not this silly liberal stuff where we're going to put on uh, funny evil hats. A resistance movement where we are standing steadfast in the faith against wickedness and evil and perverseness in this generation. Standing fast in the faith. When we oppose the enemy, the enemy, when we submit ourselves to the Lord, when we oppose the enemy in the name of Jesus Christ, when we stand our ground on the surety of the scriptures, when we resist his wiles, when we claim the victory in faith, when we shake off discouragement in the name of the Lord, Satan falls from heaven faster than lightning crashing to the ground. He is drowned in the Red Sea of the blood of Jesus Christ. Every time we resist the slightest temptation, we honor God. Every time we humble ourselves by trusting and obeying the Lord, we glorify God. Whenever we choose character over convenience, faithfulness over ease, honesty over deceit, we honor the Lord. When we serve God with faithful obedience in the smallest of things, God is glorified just as he was at the Red Sea. Paul reveals to us the wiles of the devil. He reveals to us in scriptures the things that he came against, or maybe I should say they came against him in the scripture. And I'm just going to go through these quick, just give you the references for sake of time. So in Acts 13, 7 through 12, when the apostle Paul encountered people trying to hinder his ministry and dissuade his hearers from following the Lord, he saw it as the hand of Satan. In Acts 26, 17 through 18, when Paul looked out over an unsaved audience, he blamed Satan for their lostness. The apostle Paul lamented to young Timothy that those who reject the gospel are caught in a snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. In 2 Timothy 2.26, likewise, when men and women confess Christ as their Savior, Paul saw it as a blow to Satan's empire in Colossians 1.13 and 14. In Romans 16.17-20, when Paul encountered troublemakers in the church, he discerned the crafty hand of Satan. In 2 Corinthians 12, 7, Paul believed that Satan had sent him a thorn in the flesh, a spe special messenger to buffet him. When Paul was unable to visit the Thessalonian church, Paul wrote, We wanted to come unto you, but Satan has hindered us. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 18. When Paul exercised church discipline on a sinning church member, he turned him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his soul may be saved in 1 Corinthians 5.5. 5. When married couples in the church were having uh, intimacy problems, issues, increasing temptation towards immorality, Paul blamed lap lapses on the devil in 1 Corinthians 7.5. When the apostle came across Gentiles worshiping idols, Paul knew Satan was behind it in 1 Corinthians 10, 20, and 21. When he found Christians harboring bitterness and unforgiveness towards each other, Paul saw the hand of Satan. He instructed the Ephesians never 
to go to bed angry. Don't give the devil a foothold in your life. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. Paul told the Corinthians to forgive the man who had sinned against them, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. 2 Corinthians 2, 11. When his converts strayed from the glorious good news of the gospel, Paul attributed their behavior to the devil. 1 Timothy 4.1, Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in later times some shall depart from the faith, what giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrine of devils. 1 Timothy 5.15 says, For some are already turned aside after Satan. The wiles, the schemes of the enemy. When false teachers arrived in the churches, turning believers from simplicity, the simplicity of salvation in Christ Jesus unto works of the law, Paul believed that they had been sent by Satan in 2 Corinthians 11, 13 and 15. Paul asked the Galatians, who has bewitched you that you would turn away from the truth in Galatians 3, 1. Paul did not want novices to be in leadership positions in the church unless they should be influenced by Satan and make a mess of things, hindering the work of God. 1 Timothy 3, 6, and 7. Paul encourages in battle. Ephesians 6, 11, and 12, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We need to be aware of the fact that we do indeed have an enemy who seeks to destroy our lives, but the answer is submission to God, resisting him, the devil steadfast in the faith. We see in the life of Job, Job would certainly understand this message. In one terrible season, he lost his herds to barbarians, his children to a great wind, his health to disease, his wealth to misfortune, the respect of his wife, his reputation, and standing in the community. He, be, he became the mocking and the ridicule of others. As he sat among the ashes of his life, scraping the numerous boils with pottery shards, his friends came and loaded him down with Accusations attacking, attacking his character. At one point, his wife says, why don't you just give up your integrity, curse God, and die? Was that Satan speaking through his wife? I believe so. Satan had hurled his best at Job to destroy his soul and his confidence in God. But Job, what did he do? He gave glory to God in the midst of tragedy. He worshiped God. He bowed down and he worshiped and he thanked the Lord for his love and his goodness and his mercy. How do we respond when things don't go our way? I know I don't respond well when I'm behind the wheel of a car driving. Are we more like the Hebrews complaining and murmuring and casting blame? Or are we like Job who gives glory to God? How do we respond when everything comes crashing down around us? Hopes, dreams, aspirations, all of the hard work and faithfulness, which seems to be decimated into a pile of ashes in an instant. How do we respond? Do we draw nigh unto God? Do we keep ourselves under the protective cloud of the Almighty? Do we yet praise him? For this is the will of God in our lives, that we should praise him in all situations, just like the banner says over there. In Exodus 14, Pharaoh could threaten the Hebrews with a thousand swords clashing, dust clouds being stirred up by the chariots, thundering across the desert, but he was powerless, powerless to harm them as long as they remained under the protective cloud of God's glory and grace. Peter tells us, resist him steadfast in the faith, but yet we must submit. Satan can growl, he can bark, he can lunge, he can threaten, but when we're enclosed by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, he can do us no real or lasting harm. When tragedy strikes, 
we usually make the mistake of keeping our eyes on Satan, keeping our eyes on our negative circumstances, and we forget to praise him, the Lord. We forget to praise the Lord. It is far better to acknowledge, yes, that we do have an enemy while keeping our eyes on Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith. Yes, we have an enemy, but he who is in you, Christ, is greater than he who is in the world. Amen? For all of Paul's insights and explanations about this invisible war that we're involved in, in reality, Paul focused on Christ more than anything. In Paul's letters to the churches, he names Jesus, the name of Jesus occurs in 219 verses. Lord occurs in 272 verses. And the word Christ in 389 verses. Satan, on the other hand, occurs only in 10 verses. The devil in only six verses. Paul understood the wiles of the devil, but Paul kept his focus on Jesus Christ. When things are going badly, and when you are trapped between sword and sea, when you are under the assault of the enemy, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, keep your eyes on Jesus Christ, praise him, glorify him, give thanks unto the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will see you through. He will make a way in the wilderness. He will part the Red Sea. Again, I had mentioned the wearing out of the saints. Again, in Daniel 7, uh, 25, it speaks of there's going to be a time of the wearing out of the saints where the Antichrist or the little horn's going to come and he's going to come with great swelling words, right? He's going to speak uh, of boisterous words against the Lord. And he will have a time where he will, um, the saints will be given to his hand until a time, times time and half a time. But verse 26 says, the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. Verse 27, and the kingdom and the domain and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. It is the same for us. We are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Therefore, let us have grace by which we may serve God, right? Acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. He gives us grace to serve him even in the direst of situations. Jesus told his followers that those that endure to the end shall be saved. How do we glorify God in the middle of trouble? Well, Moses gives us the answer in Exodus uh, 14, verses 13 and 14. If you want to read there. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, stand still. See the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you this day. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. That time is coming, dear saints. Then he told them, The Lord shall fight for you. You shall hold your peace. The Lord shall fight for you. He shall fight your battles. The Hebrews, Israelites, they made a fatal mistake when they see the Egyptians coming in verse 10, when they see Pharaoh coming and drawing nigh unto them, they lift up their eyes and they behold the Egyptians marching after them. And I'm sure it was quite a sight to behold. And they were afraid and they cried out, to God, that's good, that's all good. But immediately they began to attack Moses, the next verse. They cried out, but they didn't cry, their cry was not mingled with faith. Their prayers were not fashioned in, in faith in the God that could bring the victory, the God that could deliver, the God that could save, the God that would be glorified. Matthew Henry tells us that God will bring us into straits, that he may bring us to our knees. 
our knees in prayer. God will bring us into a place in our life, if he hasn't already, where we are between the sea and the sword, where we can't move forward, we can't sidestep the situation, we can't move backward, and our only resolution is to look upward and cry unto the Lord, to ask him to make a way where there is no way. We see this again and again in the men of faith throughout the scriptures, between sea and sword, that they cried out unto God, and he delivered them from his holy hill. They cried out in faith unto the Lord. In Genesis uh, chapter 35, verse 3, Jacob, he's returning home. He's about ready to be confronted by his brother Esau. And they were not on good speaking terms, let's say that. And on his way back, he realizes that he better call upon God. And it's amazing to me how he does all this managing, right, and maneuvering. Okay, well, let's send this group, and let's send this group, and then I'll send that group, trying to appease Esau before Esau meets him face to face. But he needed to realize that his answer was in the Lord. Verse 3 says, Let us arise, and let us go to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and was with me in the way which I went. He realized all of his managing and maneuvering could not solve the problem, only God could. And it's difficult for those of us who like to manage things, who like to control, right? Who like to solve problems, to solve the issue, to take the bull by the horn, so to speak, right? Get the job done, do whatever it takes to step back and to let go and to let God oftentimes is a difficult thing for us to do. In 2 Samuel 22, verse 1, these are wonderful, precious words by King David. And David spoke unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all of his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. And he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield. He is the horn of my salvation, my high tower, my refuge, my savior. You save me from violence. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. When the waves of death compassed me and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid, the sorrows of hell compassed me about, the snares of death pre- prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God, and he did hear my voice out of his temple, and my cry did enter into his ears, and he saved David. Cries of faith. I don't know if you ever had a seaside prayer event in your life. What I mean by that, I'm not talking about your regular prayer time where your daily prayer time, your quiet time, whatever you call it, where maybe you uh, cozy up in your comfy chair with your uh, cup of coffee and your devotional and your Bible. I'm talking about seaside prayers, seaside prayers, crisis time prayers, times when your prayers of desperation, prayers of intensity, prayers during maybe life-threatening situations or soul-shattering events. The Hebrews, they cry out to God, and their prayer was urgent, and it was unfeigned, and it was united. But it was unbelieving that God would do the work. We see in scriptures again, people begging the Lord, earnestly begging him. Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, comes to the Lord Jesus Christ in Mark 5, and he begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. I pray that you will come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. Even the centurion sent his servant in Luke chapter 7, and a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching, pleading, pleading him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that he is worthy for you to come, that you should do this. 
We know in James 5, James tells us about prayer and the prayer life of Elijah. He said, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly. And what that means is he prayed with prayer. He literally, he prayed with prayer that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by a span of three years and six months. James tells us in James 5, 16, that we are to confess your faults to one another and pray for one another, that you may be healed, that the effectual fervent, not the casual, not the lukewarm, not the comfy, cozy couch with a cup of coffee, the fervent prayer is effectual of a righteous man avails much. Thomas Watson, the Puritan writer, says, and again, Thanksgiving Day, the Puritans, that's why we give thanks unto God. Faith is to prayer what the feather is to the arrow. It feathers the arrow of prayer and makes it fly swifter and pierce the throne of grace. We need to pray in faith. When you face impossible odds, Approach the throne of mercy and grace and pray urgently, earnestly, fervently, unfeignedly, unitedly, believing in faith, trusting in the God who hears and answers in the time of need. A part of prayer also, Moses gives the answer here, a part of prayer is waiting upon the Lord to move, to act, to answer. We must leave room for God to intervene. Exodus 14, 13, Moses said to the people, God, fear not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Right? The Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. We have to give God room to act, room to intervene, room to cause circumstances and situations to move on our behalf. Isaiah 59, 19 says, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall raise up a standard against him. We cannot solve every problem. We cannot cure every ailment. We cannot even insure ourselves against every possible negative situation that we would face in life. We can't do the impossible, but he can. He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Ephesians tells us, in fact, the Lord delights, I believe, in doing the impossible, that he may gain the glory. We're not going to stand before the throne of glory and say, well, it's because I'm so smart, or because I'm so intellectual, or I'm so charismatic. We're going to stand and give God the glory. And this is waiting upon the Lord, committing our Red Sea situations to him in prayer, trusting and waiting for him to intervene, to interject himself again in the history of man and to interject himself into our Red Sea situations. Again, this is counterintuitive to those of us who are proactive and assertive and want to handle things ourselves who want to manage every situation. We must give God time to intervene. We are instructed over and over again in the scripture. We are instructed to wait upon the Lord. Psalm 27, 14, I'm just going to read a few of them, but um, hopefully you'll write these down and meditate on them throughout the week. Psalm 27, 14, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. You know, and again, the people that wrote these scriptures unto us were undergoing extreme, right? Extreme circumstances, extreme situations. I don't know if you had someone pursue your life trying to kill you, trying to find you and kill you, um, but David did. Extreme circumstances. Psalm 33, 20 through 22. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help. He is our shield. 
for our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in thee. Psalm 121, 1 and 2. I will lift up my eyes into the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Psalm 37, 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Psalm 46, 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. God is going to gain the glory. I believe that, you know, we are still facing tumultuous times, troubling times. Maybe I could even say terrifying times in this nation. And we're going to need these scriptures, these verses to calm our fears as well as to uh, calm our fears, but give us the confidence and the strength to overcome, to endure to the end what, what is coming upon us. And those of us that are in a difficult spot now, we need to entrust that situation to the Lord, right? We need to leave it in his hands. He alone can uh, perform the impossible, the improbable. He can execute the impossible. We must lay it aside. We must give time uh, for God to work and allow him to do the miraculous in our lives. He alone can part the waters and cause us to walk on dry land. Amen. Let's stand. Lord, you know every dire situation. Lord, you know those that are dealing with financial hardships, those that are dealing with chronic illness, those that are dealing with relationship problems, those that are struggling with depression, anxiety and fear. Lord, you know us. Help us, Lord, to not give in to those things. Help us, O oh Lord, to set our eyes, our gaze upon you, the author and the finisher of our faith. Help us, Lord, to know your love, that love that surpasses understanding. May it give us the confidence, O oh God, and the grace, Lord, to handle every situation by looking up to you. Lord, we ask that you would intervene. We ask, Lord, that you would interject yourself, O oh God, into the lives of those around us that need you, O oh God. We pray that you would intervene in circumstances and situations, O oh Lord, that you would receive the honor and the glory, Lord, and that even though we're going through difficult times, O oh God, Lord, may you change us and work in our lives. Lord, may we realize, Lord, again, that you are the author and that you are the finisher, Lord, and you are going to allow these things for your honor and for your glory. We must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom of heaven. And it's your desire, O oh God, to transform us into the image of your Son. And that's definitely going to take a lot of work. Lord, when we face the fiery trials... May we come forth as gold, and may you be glorified. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.